Welcome everyone to September Grand Rounds. Um, this is the second in our, our series for the academic year. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker for this morning, I'd like to do our land acknowledgement. So Ottawa is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia and we honor them and this land. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. CHEO also honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this morning, Dr. Melinda Elliott, who is a neonatologist at the, with the Pediatrics Medical Group in Baltimore and Chief Medical Officer of Prolacta Bioscience. Dr. Elliott earned her degree of medicine from uh, from West Virginia University School of Medicine and trained in pediatrics and neonatal perinatal medicine at the University of Florida, which is the city from which she is now uh, presenting to us, uh, probably on holiday. From there, she moved up the Eastern Seaboard to Baltimore with professional and clinical positions at the John Hopkins Hospital, Union Memorial Hospital and Franklin Square Hospital Center. She then joined the faculty at the Herman and Walter Samuelson Children's Hospital at Sinai in Baltimore and continues to serve as a clinical neonatologist with the Pediatrics Medical Group. She joined Prolacta Bioscience in 2016 as Senior Director, Clinical Education and Professional Development and is currently the Chief Medical Officer. At Prolacta, she serves as the voice of the patient working to ensure that the needs of premature infants are being articulated and that relevant treatment and product opportunities are identified. Dr. Elliott has committed her career to the care of vulnerable premature infants and has researched the benefits of an exclusive human milk diet, EHMD, for extremely low birth weight premature infants in the neonatal ICU, with publications on the breastfeeding practices of mothers of very low birth weight infants. Dr. Elliott is an experienced neonatologist, educator, mentor, and leader in neonatal intensive care. Her title, Presentation for this morning is Clinical Benefits and Science Behind Exclusive Human Milk for Very Low Birth Weight Infants, Balancing Growth and Outcomes with Cost. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elliot. And if this were a live presentation, Dr. Elliot, you'd hear lots of applause. So over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jabor, and thank you all for allowing me to speak with you this morning. Um, I, I think probably some of you are thinking, why do I have to hear about what uh, tiny babies in the NICU eat. And I would argue that at the end, hopefully you'll understand that it affects us all. Because if we can discharge a baby who looks like this little guy, home healthy, happy, and without long-term problems, all of us will benefit. And you very well will see these babies and young children in your offices. Just for my objectives, I think we've already uh, put those out there, but I just would like to understand um, the scientific rationale behind the use of an exclusive human milk diet, why a breadth of HMOs matters in the diet of very low birth weight infants. I wanna recognize the importance of early enteral nutrition in these babies and examine the evidence for avoiding cow milk. I, um, just a little bit about me, I had no disclosures until I joined Prolacta in 2016. And um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about how I got here so that when you hear my crazy passion as I start talking about these products, I hope I can give some sort of uh, basis for that. I have been a neonatologist my whole career and I actually intended to probably just die on the floor of the NICU and no one could resuscitate me because uh, you know I'm too big. I don't fit in the isolate. But um, we had a baby in our nursery back in 2011. And it was a typical 28 week infant. He was healthy. He was on his mother's milk with cow milk fortifier as we typically did. He, I went home one evening. He was on full feed, no respiratory support. I came back the next morning and he had developed horrific necrotizing enterocolitis just overnight. He was three weeks old at the time and went to surgery, had a significant portion of his small bowel removed, ended up with short gut syndrome. And so for the next mm, seven and a half months or so in our nursery, that little guy suffered uh, as we tried to save him and grow him and get him big enough for a bowel transplant. Um, we failed. 
And at eight and a half months of age, he passed away from liver failure and sepsis. And everyone was devastated, not the least of which his family. And all I could think about was how much he had suffered, how much that cost him in physical pain, how much that cost his family in emotional pain, and how much it cost the hospital in dollars uh, to care for that little guy without being able to send him home. And I thought there has to be a better way. So at that time here in the US was when the American Academy of Pediatrics put out the recommendation for the use of donor human milk when mother's milk is not available. At the very same time, I became aware of the prolactic human milk-based fortifiers. So I made a decision to bring both in at the same time, because remember this was 2011. Um, we brought them both in, we developed a feeding protocol and we started using the products. Um, I, I believe strongly that breast milk is for babies and cow's milk is for cows. And I was able to convince my hospital and I think it was easier back then um, to allow me to do this. We wrote a very strict protocol. Um, we studied our outcomes and we showed for our hospital how much better this was. But for me and for the staff in our NICU, about three weeks after we started using the products, we didn't need to wait and see our data. We saw the difference in our babies. The babies were just healthier. When we saw our data after collecting it for the next uh, couple of years and, and we published our paper, um, we were able to, to prove at least in our hospital, the advantages of using these products for this, this very, tiny group of babies. Um, since then, I have uh, I published that paper. I started giving some talks for Prolactive. And the next thing I knew, they offered me a job in 2016. And I thought, why not? I, I can help more babies doing that. I have the good fortune to be supported by them. And I can still do a week in the NICU every couple of months. So I get my baby fix. And this has really just been an amazing opportunity for me. So that's how I got here to be standing in front of you today. Due to the time, I'm just gonna be giving a very brief overview of some of the small amount of the published literature. There are currently more than 20 papers published in the US, Canada, and Europe with over 6,000 infants, individual infants in these studies. And I'm happy to come back and give you more specific information, particularly if, if the neonatology team would like that. So I'm gonna take us back to what we knew in the 1990s and 2000s when Neonatology was clearly in the modern era, and we really thought we had this nailed. Um, and I, I know that all of you know, we learn new things every day. And the amount of knowledge that has occurred since this time in human milk is just incredible. Now we know clear back, uh, probably before 1986, but one of the greatest articles that, from the Journal of Pediatric Surgery in 1986 showed us that we can improve treatment and prevention of necrotizing enterocolitis if we are able to suppress or modify the gut flora. And so it was the early days of microbiome investigation, but we already knew necrotizing enterocolitis was related to the gut microbiota. We also learned in 1990 that necrotizing enterocolitis was six times more common in babies who were fed formula only um, than those who were fed breast milk and 10 times more common in those fed formula after adjusting for a number of the risk factors associated with the disease. We also know um, right about the same time, um, a little later, when Dr. Aaron Krantz published his seminal article on neurodevelopment and nutrition. We know we have to feed these infants. And Dr. Aaron Krantz in 2006 showed a significant inverse relationship between growth velocity and the likelihood of cerebral palsy, MDI and PDI scores less than 70, and neurodevelopmental impairment. So it's not just we can feed them mother's milk only, and that's the end of the problem. We have to feed them appropriate nutrition. So we know mother's milk is best, but we require fortification. We have to have good growth. At the time, by the mid 2000s, the risk of cow milk fortification was felt to be a necessary evil because we needed to support brain development. At the time cow's milk fortifiers were invented and use was started, there was no alternative. We all used cow milk fortifiers. And there were no studies specifically looking at the danger of cow milk fortification as cow milk was the only option. 
There are unpublished studies from Dr. Alan Lucas, I wish he would publish them, looking at long-term cow milk exposed premature infants and that those infants did worse long-term than infants who did not receive cow milk. And then there was a nice systematic review and meta-analysis done in 2018, uh, published in the Nutrients Journal. And it was a meta-analysis of six randomized trials with over 1,400 babies and 43 observational studies with 14,000, almost 15,000 infants. This was all in the post-1990 literature. So it's quite a mix of care. Um, you know, care has changed dramatically in the NICU since 1990, but post-1990 is the era of modern human milk fortification. This meta-analysis aimed to provide a direct comparison between exclusive human milk and exclusive preterm formula. Unfortunately, some of the studies were mislabeled as exclusive human milk as I refer to it, which means all human milk and no cow milk products. They did examine whether any human milk was protective when infants also received preterm formula and looked at a dose-related effect of human milk. Both exclusive human milk and any human milk were compared with exclusive preterm formula. And what they found was that a higher proportion of human milk was more effective than lower amounts, as we would expect, and that there's an increased adjusted risk ratio for neck and severe neck as you add anything other than human milk, or you decrease the amount of human milk taken in. And the authors quoted, this supports a policy of moving to a 100% human milk for neck protection when mothers are unable to meet all their infants' requirements. So it is basically a plea for donor human milk and human milk-based fortification prior to um, using studies prior to the development of, of human milk-based fortifiers. So let's talk a little bit about the science behind why human milk matters. Well, first of all, when we're feeding fresh mother's milk, which is without a doubt, the primary base diet for every small infant and every infant, if we can uh, obtain fresh mother's milk. We know that it's a source of a starter microbiome if you deliver it freshly. We know it's a source of pathogen-specific immunoglobulin or secretory IgA that the mother was exposed to. It's also a so source of immune cells, macrophages and other immune cells when delivered freshly. Even pasteurized donor human milk is a source of antimicrobial proteins such as lysozyme, lactoferrin, and cytokines. So if you can't get fresh mother's milk, you at least can get pasteurized donor human milk. And we also know that the stool microbiota of human milk fed infants are enriched for commensal Florida flora and um, much less pathogenic flora. So if you think about gut micro, um, microbial ecology and time, you think about the timeline of how the gut is colonized with certain microbes. In an ideal world, a healthy gut equals a healthy person. And a neonate, when they're born, particularly a premature neonate, has very few micro microbial colonizations in the gut. It's not completely sterile, but it's essentially sterile. If you develop a healthy microbiome involving bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, and others, you will have a healthy baby. If you develop an unhealthy microbiome, you put that infant at risk for necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, and retinopathy of prematurity. The same thing is actually applicable to older children and adults. If you develop dysbiosis, when you start to have such organisms as Enterococcus faecalis, Clostridium, Campylobacter, and others, you will develop illness. And we know that the association of dysbiosis is present in infants who have neck, sepsis, and, and or ROP. We also know there's dysbiosis involved in adult onset diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, and obesity. Well, so what about mother's milk versus donor milk for those infants in the NICU? The bar graph on the left is the microbiome of a mother milk fed infant. And I think without knowing what each of those bars mean, that you get an idea for what kinds of different organisms are in there. The bar graph on the right is an infant's microbiome who's fed cow milk based formula. And I think you can see the colors and the size of the bars are very different. And that's indicative of the types of microbiota that are in that intestine. Donor human milk, which is the one in the middle, is different from both. But even just looking at it, I think you can see it's a lot closer to mother's milk 
than the cow milk formula one is. So this is some evidence from this nice study in Brazil showing that donor human milk at least supports a better microbiome than cow milk based formula. So what are some of the reasons, or if not the biggest reason, that you get a similar microbiome with donor milk rather than cow milk? One of them are products or compounds called human milk oligosaccharides, or HMOs. Now, oligosaccharides are non-digestible sugars that basically feed the bacteria in the gut. Cow milk has oligosaccharides. There are very few of them. And the, the abundance of oligosaccharides in cow milk are very low compared to human milk. Human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs are the third most abundant compound in human milk after lactose and lipids. They're slightly ahead of protein. There are up to 200 different human milk oligosaccharides that can be found in mother's milk. Not all women make the same oligosaccharides. Some women make fewer, some women make more. It's a genetically determined process. And we know that human milk oligosaccharides are good for developing a microbiome as well as protecting immune function. We also know cow milk has only a few oligosaccharides and they function very differently from human milk oligosaccharides. There are a few oligosaccharides being added to cow milk based formula or fortifier now, but that is not very common and not all of the oligosaccharides are able to be synthesized and added to cow milk. So what do these oligosaccharides do? Well, they do a lot of things. Remember, there are up to 200 different ones, and many of them have different functions. One of their main functions that everyone talks about is their prebiotic activity. These are the oligosaccharides, these little blue, yellow, and red things, and they are ingested in the human milk. And what they do is they feed the commensal bacteria. In addition, the growth of that commensal bacteria helps to prevent growth of pathogenic bacteria. Additionally, some oligosaccharides actually block the growth of pathogenic bacteria. They also work, different oligosaccharides work as anti-infective or anti-toxins. They actually bind the bacteria that you don't want growing in the gut. They also bind the toxins produced by those bacteria to prevent them from being absorbed or affecting the infant gut. Yet other HMOs bind to the mucus layer and the epithelial cells, and they support epithelial cell maturation in these very low birth weight infants. And yet other human milk oligosaccharides are actually absorbed into the bloodstream where they function in immune modulation, decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokines and increasing anti-inflammatory cytokines. So I think you can see just from the various functions of these HMOs that you need a large number of them to actually get all the effects. There was a beautiful study out of Europe a couple of years ago, um, looking at the diversity of HMOs in milk and whether or not there was an association with the subsequent development of necrotizing enterocolitis in extremely low birth weight infants. So these are infants under a thousand grams at birth. And what they looked at was the HMO content of the mother's milk in babies who developed neck, which are the blue bars here, and babies who did not develop neck, which are the red bars here. And what they showed, what this means, this Shannon Alpha Diversity Index means that it looks at the diversity of HMOs present in the milk. The taller the bar, the more diverse the HMO content. So what you can see, I think very clearly, is that kids who developed neck, their mothers had a much lower diversity of HMOs. Now we continue to search for what particular HMO might be responsible for this phenomenon. But until we can actually determine which one it is, and I suspect it's not one, I suspect, suspect it's actually the diversity that matters. It is important to provide a diversity of HMOs to these very low birth weight infants. And currently the only way to assure diversity to these very low birth weight infants is to use mother's milk primarily or donor milk as a base and then feed them in a um, human milk-based fortifier because the human milk-based fortifiers have the entire breadth of HMOs in them because of the large number of donors involved in making the products. The other part of human milk that is incredibly important is the, are the other bioactive compounds in addition to HMOs. These are just very few of them, just five I chose. Um, Proteins such as lactoferrin, immunoglobulins, lysozyme, and alpha-lactobumin are all very important 
in infant growth and development and health and immune function. When you pasteurize human milk, you do decrease some of these, but common holder or vat pasteurization does not eliminate these proteins. And they are present in both human donor milk and in human milk-based fortifiers. The milk fat globule is just as important as the others. And the milk fat globule has been ignored until very recently. An intact milk fat globule provides the right kinds of fats and fatty acids to the infant gut at the right time if the globule is taken in intact. Products that are homogenized destroy the milk fat globule and destroy the milk fat globule membrane so that the infant is only receiving pieces or broken down pieces. And it's likely that absorption will not be the way it is intended to be if the milk fat globule is not intact when digestion. The milk fat globule provides DHA, arachidonic acid, it provides sialic acid, and it supports both the gut microbiota and supports cognitive development and brain growth. So let's talk a little bit about decreasing morbidities with providing human milk and avoiding cow milk. So first of all, just for clarity, what is an exclusive human milk diet? It's a diet containing 100% human milk derived products, preferably mother's own milk as a base milk. If there's inadequate amounts of mother's milk or if she doesn't have any, then human donor milk is preferred as a supplement. There is a human milk based formula available, um, but not currently in Canada and donor milk is the preferred supplement. And then only human milk derived fortifiers all the protein, fats, and carbohydrates that you would supplement the mother's milk with are provided via human sources. The first study done, and the one that started me on my path to using these products, was in a, was, were two prospective randomized trials comparing the use of a human milk-based fortifier to a cow milk-based fortifier or formula. The studies were done in 2007 to 2009, and one of the biggest problems with them was that formula was involved, and none of us use formula in these days in 2021 for these very small babies. In 2007 to 2009, everybody used formula. So um, that is part of the problem. So shortly after those studies were published showing the benefits of the human milk products, a second study was done reanalyzing the data in terms of how much exposure to cow milk these infants received. And this study by Abrams, Chandler, and Lee showed us that exclusive human milk had lower mortality, neck, surgical neck, and sepsis. And there was indeed a dose response relationship. And this is a graph from that study. On the X axis from zero to 100 is percent of the diet obtained from a cow milk product. So on the left, zero is 100% human milk based diet. On the right is 100% cow milk formula diet. And in between are the amounts of the diet as the infant received more and more and more cow milk products, whether it be fortifier or formula. On the Y axis is the probability of remaining free of necrotizing enterocolitis. And I think you can see this looks remarkably like a Kaplan-Meier plot, where as you increase the amount of cow milk in the diet, you decrease the probability of remaining free of necrotizing enterocolitis. This is a graph on late onset sepsis from the exact same study, and it is designed the same way. And again, just like a Kaplan-Meier plot, as you increase the amount of cow milk in the infant's diet, you decrease the probability of remaining free of sepsis. Both of these are quite indicative of a dose response relationship. The more cow milk you get, the less healthy the infant is. Another study that came out was a very nice large one, 1600 babies almost, all were less than 1,250 grams, multi-center, four centers in four different US states. It was a retrospective cohort study. But what they showed in this study actually corroborated what was found in the previous studies. Exclusive human milk had significantly lower neck, mortality, late onset sepsis, and then additionally, they found less retinopathy of prematurity and less bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So these five morbidities are five of the major morbidities that these infants suffer in our NICUs. This is the study from our institution. We had almost 300 infants, all of whom were either less than or equal to 28 weeks and or less than or equal to 1500 grams. We divided our infants into four different feeding groups because we did not want to confuse those infants who received formula with those who did not. So our human milk group was the prospective group. 
And the cow milk mixed and formula groups were the immediate prior in time retrospective group that matched based on inclusion criteria of gestational age or birth weight. The human milk group was, um, had 87 infants in it. It was 30% of the total population. These kids received exclusively human milk products, mother's own milk or donor human milk as a base, and were fortified with the prolacta human milk-based fortifiers. The cow or bovine group is all mother's milk. These infants did not receive donor milk. These are infants whose mothers were able to produce enough milk for them. And it was actually our largest group with 127 infants or 43% of the total. The mixed group received a combination of mother's milk with a cow milk based fortifier. And when there was inadequate mother's milk in volume, it was supplemented with formula. It was just a small number of patients, 49, 17% of the total. And the last group, the smallest group were formula fed babies. These were kids who in the pre-group mothers were not providing milk for whatever reason. Um, now, one thing of note is that when the data was analyzed, the formula fed infants were actually two weeks more mature than all three other groups. These infants were right around 30 weeks gestation because of their birth weight, they were included. Whereas the mixed bovine and human groups were all right at 28 weeks. So when you see the data, please remember the formula kids were a little more mature. The first thing we noticed and the most impressive part of using a human milk-based fortifier is what we defined as feeding intolerance or feeds being held for 24 hours or more due to bilious emesis, bloody stools, or significant abdominal distension, which required the clinician to stop feeds for at least 24 hours. The human milk group, you'll notice only 6% of kids had feeds stopped for 24 hours or more. 94% never had feeding interruptions and tolerated their feeds beautifully. In the bovine or cow milk fortification group, remember this is all mother's milk. There's no formula in this group, nor is there donor milk. 34% of the time, over a third of the time, these infants had their feeds stopped for at least 24 hours. Half of the kids, those in the darkest purple here, this happened to more than one time. The mixed group did the worst. And I think this just supports the need for donor human milk in this patient population. And the formula group did a little better than the mixed group, but I attribute that to the fact that they were two weeks more mature. And this is a significantly, um, a statistically significant reduction in feeding intolerance in the human milk group compared to the others. What that feeding intolerance sort of uh, correlated with was nine to 10 days longer to reach full feeds in all three groups compared to the human group. That's nine to 10 days more parenteral nutrition and nine to 10 days more central line days. And we also had longer length of stay in every group except the human group. Now only the mixed group reached statistical significance, but given the fact that all these groups stayed in the hospital longer, this is certainly clinically significant. And remember those formula kids who were two weeks more mature gestationally, they stayed in the hospital a week longer than the human milk fed infants. And of course, the reason we started this was because of that baby that had neck, our neck rate in kids under 1,250 grams prior to starting this project was 10% in both the cow milk group and the mixed group. We dropped that to 1%. We've kept it at 1% since then. Um, we actually went three years without any necrotizing enterocolitis, but then it came back and we see it at about a 1% rate. I would like to totally eliminate it, but we have not found a way to do that yet. And these are our secondary outcomes. Just like Dr. Hare's study I showed you with the 1500 babies, we saw a significant decrease in ROP and BPD uh, when adjusted for gestational age. This was statistically significant across all groups. And these are the gestational ages of the groups. Like I mentioned, 30 weeks in the formula group, right at 28 weeks in the other three groups. Another study that came out looked at a product called cream. Cream is simply a fat modular. It gives you the ability to add extra calories to these babies' diets when you are providing adequate protein and you need a little more calories for growth. And that product is gonna be available in Canada within the next few weeks, I believe, um, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, we know that cream works as a great fat modular. It is full of DHA and ARA, and it seems to actually, in this study, improve outcomes such that in this study, which was a prospective randomized trial of cream versus no cream in an all-human milk-fed group, 
The cream group actually was discharged at a lower postmenstrual age by 1.7 weeks and had a shorter length of stay by 12 days. Both are great outcomes, which will allow you to reduce costs in your NICU if you can get these babies out of the hospital sooner. Now I wanna tell you about a brand new study. You guys are the first ones hearing about it because it's actually being presented at the Jens conference, probably while I'm talking right now um, in Europe. Uh, this is a poster by Dr. Amy Hare that is being presented there, um, looking at the effectiveness of an exclusive human milk diet in premature infants who are less than 750 grams of birth. This is data from two randomized and two large cohort studies of infants less than 750 grams. This is possibly the largest study of infants this size that has been done so far. What they did is they took the outcomes from these four studies and combined the mortality and morbidities of prematurity to examine whether or not there's an advantage to the exclusive human milk diet specifically in this weight and age group. There were 300 plus infants in each group. They are tiny babies right at 25 weeks and their birth weights are right at 630 grams. And the two groups are the same from demographics with the exception of slightly smaller head circumference by 0.2 centimeters um, in the birth head circumference in the uh, cow milk group. And what they found is that for almost all of the morbidities of extreme prematurity, there is a significant improvement in using an exclusive human milk diet than in using a cow milk based diet. Improvements in sepsis, severe retinopathy of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, necrotizing enterocolitis, neck requiring surgery, and then the mortality morbidity index consisting of actually uh, mortality, sepsis, ROP, BPD, and neck, all significantly better in infants who receive exclusive human milk. This study further emphasizes the importance of using exclusive human milk in this extremely high risk group and avoiding cow milk products. Now, what about growth? Remember I mentioned Dr. Aaron Cran's seminal study in looking at growth and that babies have to grow to have good outcomes and good development. Well, why does it matter? First of all, we know very low birth weight infants have incredibly rapid rates of growth and they require unique nutritional needs in energy, protein, minerals, vitamins, all of it to meet the metabolic demands. The brain and the heart have the highest metabolic demand and then they also need calories and support for growth. They're, they have minimal nutrient stores. They have almost no brown fat. They have nothing to mobilize to actually keep blood sugar up and they have nothing to mobilize um, to enable them to grow. And they are, have been historically limited in what they get in the first few postnatal days enterally, mostly because of fear of neck and a misunderstanding as to how it is safe to feed these babies. There was a clinics in perinatology completely devoted to necrotizing enterocolitis put out quite a while ago, but I loved one of the statements that they made, which was the preoccupation with preventing neck has contributed to the chronic undernourishment of stable, growing, very low birth weight infants. They also commented on the fact that we know inadequate nutrient intakes affect neurocognitive development adversely. And we also know delayed feeding and or starvation is associated with basically a flattening of the gut. You get fewer mucosal antibody cells, you lose your local immune response, you decrease your intestinal enzyme levels, you get mucosal barrier breakdown, and all in all, this makes the infant more susceptible to infections if you don't feed him. So let's talk a little bit about brain growth and what happens when you don't feed these babies. Well, this is a great diagram from a, an, a lovely article 20 years ago now um, by Thompson et al, looking at the first thousand days of life. And we talk a lot about the first thousand days and as pediatricians, I know you are well aware of the first thousand days, but I wanna look in this blue box here. This blue box is when we have these babies in the NICU from minus four months before birth to birth. And if you look at this green part right here, this is brain development. Cell migration occurs between six and 24 prenatal weeks. And that is often when these babies are born, 24 to 28 weeks. At that time, you are developing your prefrontal cortex, you're myelinating, you're developing the synapses and you're developing the connections. And if we do not give the kids during this very critical time, the nourishment they need 
to do this correctly, there will be long-term consequences. This was a beautiful study that simply did MRIs of babies in utero, looking at the brain, just simply looking at the size of the brain. And if you look at this picture, it pretty much says it all. These are infants on the left born at 26 weeks gestation. These are infants' brains on the right at about 39 weeks gestation. And the difference in the size of the brain and in the infolding and the surface area of the brain is dramatic. We have to support this brain growth. 70% of every calorie we give these babies is used for brain growth. So we have to get the calories in. We know as initially from Aaron Krantz study, but more recently there've been a number of studies that looked at the effect of extra uterine and intrauterine growth on long-term neurologic development. This is almost 15 infants, 1500 infants from the EpiPage cohorts. And what they looked at was extra uterine growth, whether they had poor growth, which they defined as catch down growth where they had weight loss over a standard deviation. And then they also had following the curve, which was just along the growth curve and then catch up growth. And when they looked compared to normally growing infants, those with poor growth had higher rates of major brain pathology, higher rates of BPD, neck, sepsis, and then later cerebral palsy, school difficulties, and moderate to severe cognitive deficiency. Another beautiful study done in Europe by Schneider et al. looked at the early macronutrient intake and its correlation with regional, regional and total brain growth and subsequent psychomotor outcome in 18 months. And what they found, which makes a lot of sense, is that the higher energy intake during the first two weeks of life predicted better brain development. But another thing they found, which was a surprise, is that the differences between the two groups who had better growth and not as good growth was the variation of enteral intake. They all had the same parenteral or IV nutritional intake, the kids that did better had more enteral intake. And the kids who had better growth during the preterm period had better psychomotor outcomes at 18 months. And then lastly, a beautiful study out of Japan by Nakanishi et al. looked at a retrospective multicenter cohort of infants less than 32 weeks in the neonatal research network in Japan. It was almost 14,000 infants who were followed until age three. And they evaluated them for outcomes such as cerebral palsy, need for home oxygen therapy, and visual hearing and cognitive impairments at age three. And what they found was that the shorter the time to establishment of full enteral feeding, the lower the prevalence of abnormal long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. So we need to feed these babies and we need to get them off IV nutrition. And lastly, what do we need to feed them? I think you know, we need to feed them breast milk. This was a study done by Blessa et al. that came out in 2019, who looked at the a number of days infants received solely breast milk in the NICU. And what you're looking at here are interhemispheric connections in the blue-green and intrahemispheric connections in the purple. Kids who received breast milk exclusively more than 75% of the days in the NICU had connections that looked like this. Kids who received breast milk exclusively more than 90% of the days in the NICU had connections that looked like this. And I think most of us feel good about 75%. I would argue we need to go for 100 and get as close as we can because there is a clear difference here between these connections. So we can do this with an exclusive human milk diet or a diet using human milk-based fortifiers. This is a study by Houston et al. that looked at their evolution of using human milk in their nursery. This era was a retrospective era where they used preterm formula in their optimum growth protocol to get babies to grow. Now, when, back when they were using formula, they had a higher neck rate. Um, the first thing they did was bring in uh, donor milk to replace formula. So they got rid of formula in this era. And what they saw was a drop in their neck rate to 9%. And these are kids under 1250, not under 1500, under 1250. And they saw okay weight gain and okay length and head circumference gain. Maybe not quite as good as the formula, but still not statistically different. But they still had this 9% neck rate. So they wanted to drop that further. So what they did is they brought in exclusive human milk diet and they push calories and they push fortification in this unit. So what they did without statistically changing growth is they dropped their neck rate to about a third of what it was when they had formula 
a little more than half of what they did had when it was um, donor milk, but they had the same growth across all three eras and perhaps brought their length and head circumference growth up closer to the formula era. So what these authors showed was that a standard feeding protocol with early fortification improves head circumference and length in those babies fed exclusive human milk. Amy Hare then presented another study looking at adequate growth. She just did a prospective observational study. These were little babies under a kilo, just under 28 weeks, where they fortify at 60 milliliters per kilo per day, much earlier than was traditionally done. And what she showed was that they had adequate growth again when they fortify early. And these authors concluded early and rapid advancement of fortification leads to growth meeting targeted standards with a low rate of extrauterine growth restriction. Now at Texas Children's Baylor College of Medicine, they fortify with the plus six product with the human milk-based fortifiers at um, 60 cc's per kilo per day feeding volume on day of life five. And remember what I told you about early enteral intake and getting off of ID nutrition and long-term brain development. They are successful in Texas doing this. So again, what's the data about feeding early? Is it safe? Well, there are a number of studies in the published literature now using human milk to fortify at or before 60 milliliters per kilo per day. The original prospective trial had an arm where they fortified at 40 per kilo, and all of these other studies fortify somewhere below 60 cc's per kilo per day. Some people are concerned about osmolality and feeding and fortifying this early. And I would argue human milk is not the same as cow milk. One of the biggest differences is that human milk fat carries the calcium and phosphorus bound to it and therefore pulls it out as being a part of the osmolar load to some degree. What that allows these fortifiers to do is be only slightly higher than mother's milk osmolality when you fortify with a plus four or plus six product. The human milk cream product I mentioned is identical to mother's milk because it has no added minerals. It is simply a fat supplement. So Bob Houston looked uh, at a study a couple of years, actually last year, where he did a multi-center retrospective cohort study. All the infants in this almost 400 uh, infant group received an exclusive human milk diet. And what he compared was the safety and growth outcomes of early fortification at or before 60 milliliters per kilo per day to later fortification, uh, later than 60 per kilo per day. Interestingly, in the early group, the gestational age and the head circumference were lower at birth. And so therefore one would suspect those kids might do worse as they are harder to grow. That was not the case. The kids who received early fortification grew statistically significantly better um, when they received fortification at or before 60 milliliters per kilo per day. But interestingly, receiving fortification that early, there was no difference in necrotizing enterocolitis and yet there was a significant decrease in the incidence of chronic lung disease in those infants fortified early. I believe this is, uh, goes along with all the previous studies showing a decrease in chronic lung disease or BPD in these babies who are fed human milk. And I believe that feeding these babies and fortifying them early with human milk products gives them access to those essential fatty acids that allows them to repair their lungs and to grow normal lungs. Another study, which you probably are all well aware of, is the O'Connor study uh, out of uh, your home province, I believe, um, down in Toronto. And uh, it's a small randomized trial, a nicely done blinded prospective randomized trial of 127 infants. Unfortunately, they powered it on my trial, the Assad trial for feeding intolerance, and then did not use the same definition of feeding intolerance that we used in the Assad trial. So therefore, it was slightly underpowered. It was a nice study in that it was 27 weeks in kids who were under 900 grams. Unfortunately, very late start of fortification. The study didn't start until the babies were fortified, which was day of life 16 in both groups at 120 milliliters per kilo per day. And I think I've already shown you some of the data that shows the importance of early fortification in kids fed exclusive human milk and the advantages of early fortification. Um, what they did find, however, was a significant reduction in severe retinopathy of prematurity from 10.7 in the cow milk fortified group to 1.6% in the exclusive human milk group. And this was statistically significant. They did find a reduction, but not a statistically significant one in their mortality and morbidity index with a p-value of 0.07, so approaching significance. 
and a cut in half late onset sepsis rate, but again, underpowered for individual outcomes and the p-value was 0.07, so approaching significance. Nonetheless, I think it's a great study. We just have to look at it with um, an eye to how the powering was done. My favorite part of this study, however, are the growth outcomes. Now, this is data that you can see if you look at the supplemental online data. These are the z-score growth charts for weight, length, and head circumference for age. Just to orient you, the solid line are the human milk fortified babies. The dotted line are the cow milk fortified babies. There is no significant, statistically significant difference in growth between the two groups. Both groups grew the same. However, you'll notice the weight lines follow each other and without any change. But the length and head circumference lines, while the human milk group starts below the cow milk group, by the end of the study period, before the babies are weaned off the study products, both length and head circumference in the human group surpass that in the cow group. Now, I will agree this is not statistically significant, but to me, this is more appropriate growth. Better growth of length and head circumference infer better protein intake and more um, healthy growth than simple weight gain without length and head circumference. So I love this study and I love this growth so why would just a little bit of cow milk fortifier matter? If you're using a powder, it's an extremely small volume, and that is quite true. However, if you have mother's milk who has been pumping for three to four weeks as an infant with 26 weeks gestation, four weeks in is only 30 weeks, mom's protein value of her milk will be approaching that of term milk, which is 0.9 grams per deciliter, even though her baby is still only about 30 weeks gestation. If you fortify um, to 80 calories per deciliter and attain a protein um, goal of about 2.3 grams per deciliter of protein, you will have about 50 to 55% of your protein in that infant's feed from a cow milk or foreign source. Where of course, if you use a human milk product, all of it remains human. Um, Lastly, I want to just kind of talk about a meta-analysis from Alan Lucas, where he looked at the risk of cow milk exposure. He basically took the three studies that are available, O'Connor, Sullivan, and Assad, that had an all-human milk as a base, and looked at, in a meta-analysis, the risk of whether or not um, any cow milk fortifier would have any effect on the major outcomes of prematurity. And what he found, um, as you might expect, was that for necrotizing enterocolitis, it favors human milk to avoid it. ROP does better if you favor human milk. PDAs are lower in the human milk fed group. Feeding intolerance, when you define it for 24 hours feed stop, is lower in the human milk fed group. And then the mortality morbidity index adapted from O'Connor is significantly lower in the human milk fed group. And then lastly, I wanna to briefly touch on long-term outcomes. This is a study out of Texas. These children had better catch-up growth at age two, showing better body composition and better metabolic outcomes, something we have struggled with historically in the small for gestational age group. These kids did not have increase in insulin resistance at age two, which is a good sign for long-term outcomes. Another study looking at body composition at age two showed kids that were similar to term controls. No increased fat mass, similar lean mass. I'm sure many of you have seen babies coming out of the NICU who were extremely preterm, but were shorter and a little fatter, and that is not a healthy outcome that we're trying to achieve. This looks like feeding with exclusive human milk will give us a better outcome long-term from a body composition and bone mineral content perspective. This is age five, a different study, no difference between exclusive human milk preterm infants and matched full-term controls at age five. The kids look the same, height, weight, and BMI. And then lastly, a long-term neurodevelopmental outcome of preterm babies in a multi-center trial, retrospective multi-center cohort study, exclusive human milk versus cow milk-based fortifier. 252 babies looking at them at a about age two corrected. These kids received exclusive human milk in the unit and were transitioned to a cow milk product at 34 weeks, as is usual practice in these institutions. 
And what they found at the age of two was an improvement in the Bailey three cognitive composite score, which was statistically significantly better in the human milk fed kids compared to the cow milk fortified kids. So a seven point increase in the Bailey cognitive score is significant and it gives these kids a better long-term outcome. But why might that be? I alluded to it earlier. One reason is DHA and arachidonic acid levels. This is a small study that prospectively looked at DHA levels in two units, one that was exclusively human milk fed, Texas Children's, one that was cow milk fortified, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. And what they found was that human milk fortification preserved the birth levels of DHA. There's less of an increase in linoleic acid levels. There's better length and head circumference velocities at 36 weeks with similar weight between the groups, very similar to what O'Connor found. And the cow milk group had a 30% drop in DHA from birth. Arachidonic acid levels did drop in both, but human milk dropped less and the enteral fat and protein intakes were greater in the human milk group. And the authors feel that human milk-based fortification improves DHA status compared to cow milk fortification. And now for the elephant in the room, the financial cost. In my hospital, we looked at cost and I don't want you to look at the dollars because I realize you're in Canada and I'm in the US and these US dollars are crazy high. I admit that. What I want you to look at though, is that the human milk group in my study was significantly less expensive. And that is when I included the cost of the human milk-based products. At my unit, we received the cow milk products for free. And so this decrease in cost in the human milk fed group is due to the improved outcomes. These kids cost more because they had worse outcomes. And there's a beautiful study down of your own, done out of your own institution that came out um, last year in breastfeeding medicine. Uh, this team did a cost analysis to estimate potential cost savings with the use of an exclusive human milk diet at your hospital in Canada using the Ontario Case Costing Initiative. Um, for time's sake, I'm gonna just cut to the chase. What they found when you calculate um, the variable costs involved with treating these infants and the cost savings with preventing various outcomes um, in your unit based on your unit's data, the hospital should have a net benefit of $107,000 if you adopt feeding kids under 750 grams the exclusive human milk diet. It's not clear to me whether there's a cost savings at under 1,000 grams because the authors chose to look at uh, under 750 and then 750 to 1500. There could be, there might not be, but I do believe you have a net benefit here of $107,000 in feeding those highest uh, risk kids. So my advice would be to reduce cost. There is already adequate evidence for the use of exclusive human milk in the highest risk babies. So choose a population in your unit that is highest risk. Is that under 750? Is that under a kilo? Treat them proactively. Don't wait for problems, prevent problems. Morbidity has both a social and a financial cost. Let's try to prevent it to the best we can. Feed them and fortify them early and safely with human milk and assure optimal intake. Get them off parental nutrition, get the IVs out, get them enterally fed and have it happen early to assure best brain growth. Follow your outcomes and adjust your outcomes as dictated by those results. I'd like to close with a quote from Dr. Arthur Eidelman, who's the editor-in-chief of Breastfeeding Medicine. He wrote this editorial in the same journal that the Van Catwick Economic Analysis out of your institution was published. And he just commented on the analysis that they limited the analysis to care that was happening in the hospital, which is very true. That's all they could analyze. Long-term societal and medical costs were not looked at in that study. There's another study by Hampson that did look at long-term costs of short bowel syndrome from neck or neurodevelopmental delay costs after the infant had neck or sepsis. And Dr. Eidelman believed limiting costs to those incurring only in hospital is actually not uh, the whole picture. He ended his editorial with this quote, yes, Cost effectiveness may well be a valid tool in choosing alternative equal treatments, but not in justifying the use of a less efficacious one. So I would argue we have plenty of data to support the use on exclusive human milk, particularly in the highest risk patients. And we should be using it in those infants to prevent morbidity. 
So thank you all very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions. These are prolacta babies who are a little older. Um, and yeah, they're all healthy, but uh, you know, it, it's not perfect, but it is so much better than anything we have ever had before. Thank you all. All right, thank you, Dr. Elliott, for a very interesting presentation. It was very clear and compelling. Uh, I think we've always known that uh, human milk is, uh, is better for babies than, uh, than cow's milk. Uh, you've presented some very compelling evidence for that. So we do have a few minutes left for questions. Um, if, um, if anyone has questions or comments, please uh, raise your hand or you can just speak up. I will try and monitor the participant list as well. I have a question. Yes, okay, go ahead, Emanuela. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Eliot. It was uh, fantastic to see, uh, you know, things that, as neonatologists working at the bedside, we see every day, right? Uh, we, sometimes, uh, you know, we, we wonder how much how much uh, more statistics or randomized, expensive randomized control trials we need to, to prove something that is uh, um, evident. Um, now, um, taking everything into consideration, actually, I had two questions for you. Um, uh, the first question was, uh, do you know about other um, uh, cost-efficient, uh, um, you know, diseases that in which uh, uh, this milk, uh, the product that could be used um, in the neonatal population. So we are always focused on the uh, tiny prematures, but we know that there are other conditions that, you know, in which we see a lot of feeding intolerance and, uh, um, you know, the only example that we had at, at, in uh, at Chill, that there was a baby that had a severe gastrointestinal disease and, and we were able to unlock him, unlock her, and, and send her home um, by using, uh, that's the only experience that we have by using uh, the, the milk. But um, I think it's important to know that, you know, um, these babies are in development, but also that sometimes the gut is the problem, even if I'm, we are very aware that the gut is not the only problem here, right? But uh, yeah. do you have any other examples for us? Um, I do. The, that's a great question. Um, you may or may not be aware that there was just recently completed a trial looking at term babies with severe heart disease um, who notoriously don't tolerate their feeds post-op. And when I say severe heart disease, I am talking about single ventricle hypoplastic left heart babies who that's one of the term infant populations that gets necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, they also notoriously don't tolerate their feeds. Um, and we just completed a trial there uh, using a human milk-based fortifier. Those kids did better. They were able to tolerate higher caloric density with human milk products and were able to grow better than the kids who received the typical standard of care, which is an elemental formula or a cow milk formula, either one, depending on the institution. There's a second trial that's almost complete looking at infants with congenital gastrointestinal disorders, omphalocele, gastroschisis, congenital atresias. That's another group that notoriously has feeding intolerance and may need fortification depending on how sick they are. Those kids do better with, uh, likely, with a human milk-based product. I don't have the results yet. I'm just hearing uh, the responses from the investigators. Um, so those are other ways to think about using human milk products. Honestly, any infant who is not tolerating a cow milk product, whether he's extremely premature or not, would likely benefit if it's a child that needs fortification, right? Um, that child will likely benefit from a human milk based fortifier. And the beauty of the products that are currently available is that you have a wide range of protein, minerals, and um, fat intake, depending on what that infant needs. And then that cream product that's coming to you in the very near future is another way, for instance, um, I would like to do a study on cream, looking at supplementing late preterm infants who are breastfeeding to get them through that time period as they, when they're not nursing well, without having to get them formula. We could give them cream Get them through those few days till mom's milk comes in, 
get them breastfeeding, supplement them as needed. I, I think there's a lot of possibility here. Now that is just something I'm kicking around in my head, but I think that's a great study that needs to be done. Thank you so much. Uh, my second question was uh, um, related to the study that I have, uh, that, uh, the cost analysis that we had done, because mainly the idea was to advocate through, you know, in, 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 to, into the institution um, about, you know, our group on neonatologists uh, about the potential cost avoidance to make them aware that there is a potential cost avoidance. In my study, in the study that we have done also, we did not consider many, many costs. Uh, as you pointed out, um, among others, the fact that the babies that they develop neck are the general, and this was the population that we study. They are transferred to CHIO in order to stay there several several weeks if they develop neck, right? Mm -hmm. And so that hospital doesn't see the cost, but mm -hmm. then CHIO sees the cost. <laughs> So it's like, it's like it's going around, you know, like it's in circles. Um, now, in terms of, uh, we didn't look specifically at the, um, we didn't want to um, really confuse too much the matter. And so we just uh, focused, we, need, we knew that for several years we had about 10, 15 year babies per year that develop neck below 750 grams. This is the population that we nowadays have regularly in the unit. And so I focused the analysis on this population. So no, we didn't look at the other one, at the other weights, just to answer your question. <laughs> Not yet. No, um, I love your study. You know that, you know, I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it was, I tried to be as straightforward as possible and then try not to, you know, confine matters there and just, uh, you know, say, okay, if you avoid this disease, this is your, uh, you know, cost effectiveness and uh, your, your cost saving later on, right? Um, but I have a question um, on that. Um, is there anything else that you could suggest as, as a group of neonatologists that we are trying to advocate for, to have this, uh, um, this uh, product, but um, honestly, just to, um, you know, I'm also studying um, molecular biology, the gut and neck, and I know that in many formulas, um, there are not some elements, other elements like microRNA and exosomes and stuff like that that in formula that don't exist. And they are very, very, you know, there, are, there is more more evidence from the research biology point of view that uh, is, uh, is enhancing this, this aspect of the well-being of the babies. But is there anything else that you could suggest um, for us to, to, to continue to, to advocate? Uh, what is your experience, if you have any tips, anything? That's a really great question. Um, so I think you have, you know, you have to convince your hospital administration. And, and I think additionally, Canada is uniquely situated because there are long-term costs that, that the government, you know, the government pays for all of it, right? So the government should care about those long-term costs as well. So your hospital should care about molecular improvements. One of the arguments, if your administration, um, you know, understands, like you were talking about the molecular biology, the breadth of the HMOs, you cannot provide that without an exclusive human milk diet. Um, there was a study specifically, for example, looking at DSLNT and higher amounts of DSLNT uh, decreasing neck as a specific HMO. That one is not able to be synthesized. There's no other way you can increase DSLNT in the diet without using human milk. Um, if you're using a human milk based fortifier, you are increasing the amount of DSLNT in the diet. Uh, that should decrease the risk of some of those morbidities that we're talking about. Um, I'm not sure how the hospital, you know, I would, I think your study should convince anyone, but you could also use this new poster that I just mentioned that's being presented at Jens because it's matches. It's less than 750 grams. It matches your size argument from your paper. Um, you could take that with your paper and say, look, this is, the age group, here's the data. This group looked at this exact age group. They saw decreases in all of these morbidities. That's exactly what we said we would see. This corroborates what we're saying. Um, there's more data to support what you've done. 
Thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, Emmanuel, I'm going to have to end it here. We are over time, unfortunately. This is very interesting. Um, you can feel free to stay on and have discussion, but I'm going to end it for uh, for everyone else. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Elliot. I really enjoyed the presentation. I found it very interesting, and I will uh, actually use it in my field of emergency medicine um, to continue to spread the word. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Bye, everyone. It's amazing.